So, uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to our online event on uh, policy relevance of international spillover effects and COVID-19 and SDG reporting, hosted by the Sustainable Development uh, Solution Network, SDSN for short, and the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, or GSN for short. My name is Barbara and I work for the GIZ program Strengthening the Sustainable Development Solution Network. On behalf of the Federal Ministry of, uh, for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, BMZ, um, our program aims at fostering the role of science and the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, especially with the focus on networks and the Global South. So, since 2013, we support the SDSN, and since 2016, we address questions of uh, global responsibility arising from international spillover effects. So thank you for your interest. Uh, I'm delighted to be a moderator for today's event. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Guillaume Lafortune from SDSN for co-hosting this event and sharing with us insights from the newly released Sustainable uh, Development Report 2020 by SDSN and the Bertelsmann Stiftung. I would also like to thank Arunima Malik uh, from the University of Sydney and Apollonia Mayola from the OECD for presenting today, as well as Finn Wilm from SDSM. Thank you very much. So the webinar will uh, give us an opportunity to learn more about the Sustainable Development Report 2020 that includes the SDG Index, which is a, a monitoring tool that uh, ranks countries on the progress towards achieving the SDGs. It uh, also includes the spillover index with the best available data on countries' positive and negative external uh, 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 so, so we also discuss the impacts that COVID-19 and the SDGs have on one another and look more caref carefully into uh, social and health spillover effects before we learn more about policy recommendations and the coherence of domestic and international measures, measures of spillover effects. Before we get started, allow me to point out that we muted all participants, so please uh, stay on mute and deactivate your camera. However, we very much encourage all of you uh, to participate actively uh, in the webinar by asking questions in the chat. Uh, we will collect your questions for a short Q&A session after each presentation, so throughout the whole webinar. Um, but However, please, um, so you can send us questions at any time. Uh, however, we might not be able to answer all of them. Um, if you experience any uh, audio or video issues, please text us in the chat uh, as well. And uh, please note that this event, event will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you always have the um, opportunity to leave the webinar. My, uh, Nicole, uh, my uh, colleague Nicole will remain available um, throughout the whole webinar to answer uh, your questions in the chat. Um, in this webinar, we also included a graphic recording tool. So you already uh, can see um, like, uh, yeah, the beginning of the picture. And um, she, uh, like Anne Lehmann, follows our webinar remotely and summarizes the findings uh, graphically. So I encourage you to follow her drawing once in a while uh, through clicking on her picture in the button below my picture or the presentation. Um, can I ask you to turn off uh, your camera, please? Thank you. So. Um, in the end, uh, we will uh, uh, have a closer look on uh, it together and point out some highlights uh, of the webinar. Um, before I hand over to our first speaker, we would like to issue a quick poll. So um, please click on the link we just shared uh, in the chat or um, go to the website menti.com and type in the digit code uh, for uh, 541027 as it shows on the shared slide, which I cannot see yet, but it is coming. It's perfect. All right. So, um, we will uh, give you 30 seconds to um, select the answers on the free questions. 
be sure, before we share them. So um, please, uh, yeah, go to the chat and click on the link. Thank you. And uh, first, we would uh, love to know which sectors are represented. So are you working in an NGO or are you part of a network? And uh, the second question is from where are you participating? So uh, please um, let us know where you're located right now in this very moment. Maybe this is not where you normally would be uh, as to travel restrictions and uh, COVID-19. So just tag where you are sitting in this very moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question is, how is your current energy level? So how are you doing? Um, and everything is allowed, really, like from one really low, ready for the weekend, to five, really high and excited for this input. So I'm giving you about five more seconds. All right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, now I would like to ask you to come back yeah. to um, to MS Teams and to look at the screen, the shared screen there. All right, and also just one last uh, hint: Can you please uh, mute yourself? That would be amazing. If you have not muted yourself, please do so. Thank you very much. Perfect. So let's look at the first question. In which field are you working? So, okay, the majority works in a government institutions or an international institution or international organization, sorry. Okay, well, I have to admit I expected that. Um, then 3% in networks and also 3% in NGOs and 8% uh, in others. Oh, it just changed, like 41 to international organization and 8 to others. Okay, perfect. Then let's look at the second question. From where are you participating? So um, let's wait until it comes up. Okay, Europe is uh, the majority. Um, but I'm very happy also to welcome people uh, from the African continent and also from Southeast Asia and Central and West Af uh, Asia and also from South America. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, look at let's look at the third question. How's our energy level? Oh, okay. I would say that's not too bad uh, for Thursday. For Thursday, well, um, so yeah, I would say um, most of the people um, are still or still have some energy. That's great. Okay, all right. So thank you for participating in this quick polls. Um, now I would like to hand over to our first panelist, uh, Guillaume Lafortune, who is the SDG Index Manager at SDSM and uh, also a co-author of the Sustainable Development Report. He is an economist by training, and prior to joining the SDSN, he worked at the Ministry of Economic Development in Quebec and at the OECD on public governance uh, reforms and statistics. So uh, Guillaume will make his presentation with his colleague, uh, Finn Wöhm, who is a data scientist and an analyst uh, at the SDSN. Guillaume, if you want to turn on your camera and your microphone, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole. Thank you also to the whole GIZ team for organizing this. Uh, Nora, Barbara, Francisca, Marin also. Um, and thank you also to uh, Arunima from the University of Sydney and to Apollonia uh, from the from the OECD for, for joining us um, today. I think we we really have two 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 great um, speakers for uh, for today's um, for today's event. Um, I'm going to try to keep the energy level as high as I can. Actually, it would be funny to do this poll like over the, the entire event to see how the energy is, uh, is, is moving. Um, I hope I can uh, at least maintain, if, if, if not even uh, like increase the, the energy level, but, uh, but let's see. Um, so as you, as you said, Nicole, I'm, um, 
Guillaume Laporte, I'm a senior economist within the SDSN. I, I coordinate the uh, production of the Sustainable Development Report uh, within the SDSN. The report was actually launched um, electronically two days ago. Um, and uh, yesterday we had a big launch um, event uh, with Jeffrey Sachs and, and, uh, and, and other country representatives. Um, this is the report which basically tracks the performance of all UN member states on the SDGs. And since um, we started doing this back in 2015, We've always included this notion of international um, spillover effects in our assessment of um, the performance of countries on the sustainable development goals. So if I can move maybe to the next um, slide, um, just to put things a little bit into, um, or actually to, to, to share with you the content of my presentation, I want to do three things um, today. The first thing is to share with you some of the, the insights, the results um, in terms of spillovers in the Sustainable Development Report um, this year. The second thing is to present to you some new work, um, a new initiative that we're doing with the University of Yale, but also with other partners um, within our RSDS and network, um, which tries basically to create a, a new international measure at the country level using production-based accounting and consumption-based accounting. So I'll try to to highlight why we think we need this um, and what um, this kind of future um, impact assessment might look like. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll um, give the floor to my colleague Finn Wolm, who will share um, some of the tools and the online material and interactive user platforms that we've done on spillovers. And a lot of this work um, has been made possible thanks to the support of the GIZ um, over the past couple of years. So moving on to the next um, slide. Um, and even the, the next one, um, just to put things a little bit into context. Um, yeah, actually the next one. Um, yeah, um, we've been doing, so we've been tracking since 2015, um, the, the performance of countries at the global level on the sustain, no, the previous one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've been tracking since 2015, the performance of countries on the, on the sustainable development goals. Um, so we have this global edition that we do um, annually, um, again, including the, the overall ranking, but also the, the spillover ranking that we do. But we also do regional editions, right? So we do editions for Africa. We're, we're launching the third edition for the Africa in, in two weeks. Um, we launched two weeks ago an edition for Latin America. Um, and we've also done report for Europe, the Arab region and, and the Mediterranean mm -hmm. Uh, countries. And in, in, in most of these assessments, we also try to capture the international um, dimension, right? The spillover um, uh, dimension of things. And this was one of the key elements and one of the, the key chapters and sections of the European report, where we had a lot of um, policy discussion, but also data around the issue of spillovers at the European level, but also for each European um, member states. Um, and where we call obviously the EU for you know strengthening the coherence in the next couple of years between what it aims to do at the domestic level and what it plans to do um, externally as well. Um, and then we also have some national editions. Um, obviously, the SDGs we won't make any major breakthroughs without the involvement of local policymakers um, and municipalities. So we also do assessment at the some national level. Mm. And here. This is something that we are starting also to try to see how can we measure, what does it mean to measure spillovers as also at the subnational level? So here the data are even more, um, I mean, it's really a, 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 an area of work that is just starting, but it's something that, that we plan to do more work also moving forward. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, our website, the data visualization is available and Finn again will, will share with you um, some more insights um, on our, our spillover tools. Next slide. So, this edition um, has six key findings, and the fifth finding here. So, if we can click, it will it will uh, highlight the fifth finding. Um, the fifth finding of the report is that rich countries generate negative spillover effects that undermine other countries' ability to achieve the goals, and that may increase the likelihood of future um, pandemics, right? Through unsustainable um, supply chains, biodiversity threats, deforestation. There's growing evidence that uh, that might increase um, the likelihood of zoonotic uh, disease and diseases transmitted uh, from, from animals. Um, and so the way we measure spillovers in the report is we categorize spillovers in three um, broad ways. And just to take a step back and if we can move to the next slide. Um, we um, we consider that the SDGs broadly recognize the importance of international spillover effects 
For instance, under SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, which requires developed countries to take the lead um, in tackling the um, the issue. And we see also some um, national governments, including this notion of spillover effects in their uh, own strategy. So the Sweden's um, generational goal, for instance, is one example of a country that has integrated this into um, their, their political communications and strategies. Um, it's also been underlined by Greta Thunberg when she speaks um, about um, or when she accused rich countries um, last year of creative carbon accounting, right? So to take only into account um, carbon emissions generated within countries and not taking into account those that are generated uh, abroad through consumption, right? It's one thing to decarbonize domestically, but if it, this is achieved by outsourcing cement and steel to another country and re-importing the production, in an SDG context, which is a global responsibility, um, this is not a, a, a practice which is compatible with the, with the SDGs, um, right? And so the way we've categorized this is through three in three broad categories. So there's the environmental environmental types of spillovers, right? So CO2 emissions that are embodied into ex, uh, imports, SO2 emissions, nitrogen, scarce water, um, terrestrial, um, and fresh water, and also marine biodiversity threats. And here they are mainly using a tool, and it's great that we have Arunima here on the panel, um, called the multi-regional input uh, output table, which are then combined with satellite environmental and social data sets. And we'll hear more uh, about this in, in the next presentation. But we go beyond also those consumption. I mean, we also track some social impacts through MRIO. So that's the last category that you have here on social security, fatal work related accidents embodied in imports. So typically European imports of textile uh, from countries with poor labor standards. We attribute some of the work accidents to the importing countries. Um, and so that's also using MRIOs. But we go beyond the consumption-based impacts, right? So our notion of spillovers goes beyond um, the MRIOs and the consumption-based notion. And we also include measures of uh, financial secrecy, corporate tax heaven, sh uh, profit shifting, positive spillovers like official development assistance. And also on the security side, the exports of major conventional weapons that might disrupt um, certain um, uh, situation in, in some parts of the world. And so next slide. What we do is that we plot um, this spillover index, so including all these measures, to GDP per capita. And here what we see is that, um, in general, um, uh, high-income countries tend to generate more um, spillover effects. And here the purple dots are actually G20 countries. So we see that a number of G20 countries are actually generating a lot of impacts. Here it's important to note that our indicators, in order not to penalize geography or the size of country, are denominated um, in per capita basis, right? So we divide by population. And so this is why small countries with relatively tr high trade intensity on a per person basis uh, generate the largest spillover effect. So this includes Singapore or Luxembourg, for instance. Um, next slide. What we have done also is to, so beyond this overall aggregate at the, at the country um, level, um, we're also mapping bilaterally um, how countries are impacting other countries. And here you have a case of a country that performing very well on, this, uh, on the SDG index, Finland, who is in the top three countries of the SDG index. But actually, when we look at how Finland is impacting greenhouse gas emission in other countries through trade, we see that it, gener it does generate um, some impacts um, uh, abroad. And this is an area um, where even Nordic countries, which are the top performers in the SDG index, can still work on. Next slide. So um, that was the kind of macro perspective, just to mention that we're also doing um, uh, some studies. And again, this, this is often supported by, by GIZ as well um, at the supply chain level. Right. Um, and looking how can we improve and make some of the key supply chains, whether it's um, the food supply chains here, we've done study for soy, um, but also other um, supply chains. Um, how can we improve the governance uh, of these supply chains and make them compatible with the achievement of the SDGs, Agenda 2030 and the Paris Climate Agreement? Um, so that's for the SDR and the, the broad work that we're doing on spillovers within the SDSN. Um, next slide. Now, I just want to briefly share a few words about a new initiative that, that, that we're launching. And this work is not published yet, so it's all things that are going to be um, published. But um, essentially what we realized, next slides, what we realized is that when we plot, um, when we looked at the some of the international benchmarks of environmental, some of the environmental benchmarks, and here we have two examples here, the Environmental Performance Index and the Green Growth Index. When we plot this to GDP per capita, and here it's the log of, of GDP um, per capita, just to, to facilitate the, 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 the view of the, of the chart, um, we, see that, we see that um, there's quite high correlation between... <laughs> Um, between some of those environmental benchmark and GDP per capita, which contradicts the major international um, yeah. 
ports, um, which yes, contradicts something. Okay. Oh, there's sorry, stuff. sorry for interrupting. Uh, yeah. Please, can you mute yourself? Mm -hmm. okay. We can hear uh, someone uh, yeah. Yeah. speaking, I guess, on the phone. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Guillaume, for this interruption. It's okay. I also see the comment to speak a bit slower, so I'm gonna slow down a little bit. It's just that I'm conscious of time, and I know we have a, pack, uh, a packed agenda. But let me let me slow down a little bit. Um, so uh, that that's how high my level of energy is uh, today. Um, so in terms of the so. So basically, we see strong correlation between some of the environmental benchmarks at country level and GDP per capita. And this, again, is kind of in contradiction with some of the major reports that we see either from IPBES or the IPCC, which basically say, look, high income countries um, do generate a lot of the of the of the impacts uh, of the negative environmental impacts um, globally. And there's a couple of reasons why um, there is this this high correlation. So. Some of these benchmarks include access to resources, like access to water, sanitation, where rich countries do better. Um, they include policy measures, so whether there's policies, strategies, or conventions that are um, adopted. Um, they sometimes not um, calculate distances to predefined uh, targets, and they generally tend to exclude um, these spillover effects, so consumption-based um, impacts. And this is this is documented in a paper that's going to come out, um, hopefully, in an OECD publication in the fall, um, and possibly also as a working paper that we're working on with the University of Yale. Um, next slide. And so what we mean um, by consumption-based uh, accounting and production-based accounting is, 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 described, uh, is described here. Um, so you have, um, you have on one side um, the domestic production uh, that is made for domestic final consumption plus the, the, the full use phase. Um, and then you have domestic production um, that's made for exports. Exports. So that's the PBA side um, uh, of things, and that's what is tradi tradi traditionally captured um, in a lot of the carbon accounting, but also in a lot of the international benchmarks that I just presented. Now, the part that is um, um, missing is this consumption-based aspect, right? So the, the these are the impacts that are generated through the imports for domestic final consumption in the importing countries, right? And so what we want to, to do with this, this new um, initiative is to isolate the import component and attribute the responsibility to the, the, importing, um, the importing country. Next slide. So we're presenting a new framework. I won't go into the details today. Um, again, this is going to be to be published soon. The main point here is that there's a domestic side. So that's is, is the next slide. Um, there's the domestic side. So it's a two pillar kind of framework with the domestic side and then the spillover um, side of things. And the idea is to be as comprehensive as possible. So to cover climate, pollution, biodiversity and natural resources. That was the previous slide, but it's OK. I'm on that slide. So. And the, and the idea is that um, this would raise visibility for global commons. It would help fill some of the gaps that we see for the EPI, the SDG index, and some other metrics. Let's, I'm on the next slide now. Um, and it would strengthen accountability on, on, uh, on action to manage global commons. The idea is also to have this initiative to help fill data gaps. So what I mentioned is that right now we capture um, some spillover effects, uh, including through consumption. One aspect that we're not covering well, for instance, right now is spillovers through physical flows, right? So uh, if you have a factory at the border of a country, then possibly most of the uh, emissions and the pollution might happen in the neighboring, um, the neighboring countries. And here it's still very hard with the data we have to attribute the responsibility uh, for this type of pollution to uh, the country where the factory is actually located. And that applies to air, air flows. It, it would also apply to uh, water flows um, uh, as well. And so in terms of timeline, we're, we aim to have the approach published in the fall and uh, to release the first report um, sometimes in 2021. Let me hand it over to my colleague Finn Wong, who will share with you um, some of the online data platforms and um, the tools, the interactive tools that we've developed over the years um, to, um, to give visibility to the, to the spillover effects and, uh, and to connect some of the great research and science that, we, that, that is being done um, to what you know, policymakers need to see and need to have uh, in their hands in order to, to understand the importance of this, uh, of this aspect. So Finn, 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 over to you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Finn Brown. I'm a data scientist and development solutions network that work together with Guillaume on the SDG index and the spillover work. 
Um, Finn, sorry for interrupting. Uh, you're very like um, um, we can't hear you clearly and loud. Maybe you can just put your microphone closer to your mouth. That would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. How's it now? Should I? Hold yeah. It? It sorry, that's better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No problem at all. Um, I'm keeping my presentation today very brief. I'm just going to introduce you to two tools that we have built for you to explore the spillover index as well as the 12 spillover indicators that we have. And I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. You should see a big map in different shades of blue. Yes. Um, you can? Yes, 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 we can. Great, okay. So this is um, the first tool that I'm showing you today is the interactive dashboards that we have built for the sustainable development solutions uh, the <laughs> Sustainable Development Report 2020 that we just launched on Tuesday. Um, and I'm focusing here specifically on our platform for visualizing spillovers. And the link for that is dashboards.sdgindex.org slash map slash spillovers. And for your convenience, I'm just going to copy that into the chat right now. Um, right here. There you all go. And so what you see here is a, is a map and um, in darker shades of blue, you see countries that are causing fewer negative spillovers on, on the world. And in lighter shades of blue, you are seeing countries that are causing high amounts of negative spillovers. Sorry for the sidebar that keeps popping up here. I think it's because I'm sharing my screen. Let me make it a little bit smaller. Um, okay. And so what you can do here is you can actually use this map to dig down into the various indicators that make up the spillover index. Right, so you have the different dimensions here that Guillaume has already mentioned, the environmental dimension, the economy and finance dimension, and the social and security dimension. And you can click on one of these indicators to actually visualize the performance on that indicator. So let's say we look at CO2 emissions embodied in imports. Then what you can see is um, which countries are causing high amounts of um, CO2 emissions abroad through their domestic, con to their consumption. Um, and their imports and which ones are causing relatively small amounts of spillovers. And you can then click on countries to actually see um, numeric value of, of those spillovers. And you can also see the evolution over time, right? And so you can click on Germany, for example, and see that the CO2 emissions embodied in imports have been growing since 2000. And you can do this for, for all of our indicators that are part of the spillover index, for example, scarce water consumption. So that is the first tool. And then the second tool that I want to share with you today is our bilateral spillovers platform. And so this is also a map, but what makes it different, different from the platform that I just shared is that this tool really allows you to not only see the amount of spillovers that a country is causing on the world, but to see in which particular countries those spillovers are being caused. Right, so let's say we click on Germany, for example, and now we're seeing how consumption in Germany is generating greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions in other countries. And we can actually see in which countries those greenhouse gas emissions are being caused. So uh, we see those are happening in China primarily, and then also some in Russia, in the United States. And this is in kilograms. Um, per cap per 100,000 population. Mm -hmm. And you can also change this to uh, show it in absolute terms. If you want to know the, the total amount of spillovers that, that Germany is causing in the world. And again, you can um, check out our different indicators, for example, fatal accidents at work. And so the idea for this tool is really to, to dig deeper and understand um, not just how, how big the amount of spillovers are that a country is causing, but to identify which countries these spillovers are being caused in. Lastly, let me just say we are currently exploring ways to make our spillover tools even better. Um, and we're particularly interested in this bilateral spillover platform to add time series dimensions to allow you to understand how spillovers are evolving over time. And we're also exploring ways to disaggregate spillover effects by sector so that um, it is possible to see then um, which sectors, for example, Germany is, is causing the most spillovers in. And um, that is it. I'm just going to copy this link as well. So you have this into the chat and then I'll hand it back over to you. All right. Thank you, uh, Guillaume and Finn, 
for sharing uh, insights on the Sustainable Development Report and elaborating on spillover effects and on the uh, data visualization tools uh, on uh, bilateral spillovers, which is funded by the BMZ. So now uh, we are open for questions. Um, so please uh, send us questions uh, for the first Q&A. Um, let me look uh, what we have. Uh, all right, so um, the first question um, is for you, Guillaume. Um, how are the regions of respective regional reports chosen? Why are there some regions more present than others? Um, yeah, thank you, Nicole. That's a great um, question. Um, so, so far, and, and what I understand by regions is the, the continental editions that we're doing. So, so far we've done three reports for Africa. So the third one is launching in two weeks. Um, we've done one report for Latin America. We have done one report for Europe. Um, we have done one report for the Arab region um, and one report for um, countries in the Mediterranean um, area. Um, so it covers relatively, uh, you know, a, a large extent of, of, of the world. We also have the global edition, which covers obviously all um, all countries. Um, and this essentially, um, I mean, this work is done in close partnership with our networks, right? So we have SDG centers in um, in Africa, in, in, in Kigali, in Rwanda. We have in, in Latin America, also in Bogota, um, Colombia. Um, and we have also centers in the in the Arab region, um, and obviously I'm based in Paris here, so we work closely with the Commission and with um, and, and with Europe on the on the SDGs. Um, maybe the only region, and we're we're discussing also a report also for for Asia and Southeast Asia, Asia ASEAN uh, countries. So I think in terms of representation, um, we're actually really trying to cover as much as we can. And these reports are important because at the global level, we're limited in terms of the data that we can use, right? So if I take, I mean here. If I take the example of Europe, um, we cannot use in the global edition the data and the fantastic work done by the European Commission, whether it's through Eurostat, the Joint Research Center, DG Environment, and other um, uh, great institutions of the European Commission, right? Because these data are not comparable um, with the rest of the world. But in the European edition, we're able to tap into um, those data sources and really to, uh, let's say, contextualize a bit more the data work. We're also able to contextualize a bit more uh, the policy messages. And I think here, and just to connect with the spillover issue, if you look at our 2019 edition of the European Development Report, we really make a call uh, for Europe. And this was released in, in, in November, so that at the very start of, of, of uh, Van der Leyen uh, Commission, um, we really made a call for Europe to um, increase coherence between what it does domestically, um, let's say on, on circular economy, plastic use, and what it does internationally, right? And so I think in this context, the, the, the transshipment of waste to Southeast Asia, if you want to be coherent, um, should should possibly be uh, reduced drastically. Uh, and if anything, Europe should also help and build capacity in other countries to deal with their waste um, and, uh, and, and with plastic use as well. So that's just to say that we're able to contextualize in these regional reports a bit more, the policy issues and the, and the data work and a final point to say that the second edition of the European report is going to come out next um, November. So we're currently uh, working on it and we're going to do extensive public consultation in the next um, couple of weeks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I have a second question for you. Uh, that is, uh, what are, in your view, the implications of COVID-19 on globalization, international supply chains and spillovers? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a question that keeps coming back, and I think it's a great it's a great um, question. Um, I mean, the first thing is that I think going back completely, uh, uh, going backwards on globalization completely would have a, a huge uh, a huge cost, especially for um, for low income uh, countries, um, but also for for our economies. Um, so. There's definitely, I think there's two two main debates here, is how do we, um, let's say, strengthen our efforts to clean the supply chains and regulate um, globalization even more. And I think here, 
um, the work from the University of Sydney, but also of other researchers, really start showing that if we don't take care of that, we're increasing the likelihood of future pandemics. So there's really an argument here with COVID to say, look, let's let's take this so issue. Of let's of let's I think well, I hear speaking over the phone. Um, so that's that's one aspect of things. How do we use COVID to say, look, we need to do further efforts and clean these supply chains, um, whether it's for soy, food sector, coffee, um, and other important supply chains, and how do we make compatible, them compatible with the SDGs Agenda 2030 and, um, and the Paris Climate Agreement? The other part of the conversation is on the aspect of dependencies. And that's to me a, a separate question here. And I think some, especially in the European context, we have seen that some countries have been um, put in a situation where they were dependent when it comes to strategic medical equipment. Um, and I think here there's a real question and that's a societal um, question. So I won't I won't answer it um, today, but I definitely think it will lead. And at least in, the, in, in France right now, there's a whole debate around this is, what are the key strategic um, supplies, especially medical supplies, where we need to make sure that we internalize at least some of the production, or at least make sure that we have the ability when these kinds of um, pandemics or, 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 or virus outbreak happen, we have the capacity to actually increase significantly our production for key uh, personal protective equipment or test kits, for instance. Um, so, so these are the two angles for me. For me, COVID really calls for cleaning even more the supply chains, which might increase the likelihood of future pandemics. And on the other hand, um, it might lead to a reflection on where are dependencies uh, and, and what are the strategic supplies where we need to keep some of the production uh, internally, domestically. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, also thank you for all of the other questions. But uh, since time is running, um, we now turn to our next panelist. And I'm very ha happy to welcome Dr. Aronima Malik from the University of Sydney. She's a researcher and lecturer, um, and her research is interdisciplinary and focuses on the assessment of uh, social, economic, and environmental impacts using input-output analysis. So, uh, Aronima, please uh, unmute yourself, and uh, you can also turn your camera on. Uh, we can see the slides, and we are good to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you to the GIZ team and Guillaume for the invitation to speak at this event. Uh, is my sound coming out all right? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yep. Uh, so in this presentation, I will talk about uh, the work that we are doing at the University of Sydney in quantifying uh, spillover effects using multi-regional input-output uh, tables. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a bit of context um, on the sort of research uh, that we do, uh, in terms of sustainability assessments, we really look at all three spheres of sustainability, so environmental, social and economic. Uh, some of these indicators were mentioned in Guillaume's presentation, for example, um, greenhouse gas emissions, we had um, occupational health and safety. Uh, so these environmental, social and economic uh, indicators and the development of these indicators, linking these to multi-regional input-output tables and then quantifying the spillover effects, what are the impacts on developing countries, who is driving these impacts, again, um, from an year to year basis and also from a time series uh, perspective. Next slide, please. So just to start off uh, by giving, giving an example of one uh, indicator which uh, we published uh, a couple of years ago in 2012. So my colleagues uh, quantified the impacts of international trade on biodiversity threats. And this world map essentially shows the interactions between different world countries. So for example, uh, if you are consuming um, coffee, um, you just have a, a cup of coffee, are you impacting uh, any um, species around the world from your consumption of coffee? So coffee consumption, uh, of course, uh, drives biodiversity threats in developing countries. That was the key finding um, of, of this paper and also other commodities that are bought by developed nations. So in terms of biodiversity threats, why is consumption driving these threats in developing uh, countries? So how do these supply chains come into play and how can we actually quantify these impacts? Next slide, please. So looking at the supply chain perspective, uh, we uh, do the quantification from an upstream supply chain perspective. So starting off with consumption down at the bottom, 
And if you are uh, consuming a particular item, be it a piece of clothing or coffee, uh, or you're buying electronic items or furniture, then you're essentially um, driving impact in the supply chains. And the way this happens is that your demand for consumption, of course, um, drives the production of that item that needs to be delivered to you, or you go to a shop for buying a particular item. Uh, for the production of that item, you, um, that particular sector that produces that item needs to get inputs from a range of other sectors in the economy. So they can, uh, the economy at a national level or at a global level is very much interconnected. So for consumption, for example, um, input of food, resources, goods, energy and services. And if each of these uh, sectors in turn need to supply um, for satisfying consumer demand, then these sectors in turn need to interact with the rest of the economy, be it the national economy or the global economy. Um, and again, you have a layer up in the supply chain. We call this the upstream supply chain. We have F for food, resources, goods, energy, and services, and then a layer up um, in a way that you have this upstream supply chain that goes like this. So uh, for supply chain assessments, uh, we use multi-regional input output tables. And we use these tables because they capture nicely the interactions between different sectors in different countries. Next slide, please. Um, so input output analysis, this uh, has been around for a while and Vasily Leontip, uh, the picture that I have on this slide, um, he got a Nobel Prize for coming up with this technique. And input output analysis relies on these so-called input output tables. And I have a really simple schematic on this slide where, where I have the sectors listed in the rows and the sectors listed in the columns. So you have the goods and services, for example, going from a construction sector in a, in a country to, to the mining sector. So if, if the mining sector needs equipment, for example, then, then you have a, 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 an interaction between the mining and the construction sector and so on. So a large matrix would have lots and lots of numbers encompassing these interactions and capturing these interactions between sectors and between, between countries. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide basically shows uh, a heat map um, and you can see these dots with different different colors. So this is a heat map for the global economy uh, for 189 countries uh, with 15,000 sectors uh, in, in the rows and 15,000 in the columns for 189 countries. And this uh, is, a, is the global trade model that we use uh, here at the University of Sydney. It's also known as EORA, uh, which I, I think many of the uh, people on call uh, are probably aware of. So EORA multi-regional input output uh, tables, uh, they capture international trade, trade between 180, 189 countries, and this is what we call a multi-regional input output table. So multi as in it captures the interactions between multiple regions and the sectors within those regions. We can link uh, these multi-regional input output tables, which are very much uh, uh, financial tables, with global data on indicators. So the indicators that you mentioned in his presentation, the, the emissions, uh, scarce water use, we also have biodiversity threats. So that's the, the first slide that I started off with. And then we also have other indicators, which are environmental, social and economic. So uh, recently what we've done is we've developed a new indicator for malaria risk. And that is what I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So we've been able to develop an indicator for malaria risk by looking at deforestation in countries, linking that to incidences of malaria, and then linking that again to the global trade database. And this paper uh, was recently published in Nature Communications, and we found that international trade uh, drives malaria risk in developing countries. Next slide, please. Next slide. I think there's a bit of lag. I can't see the slide. Yeah, okay. So um, the key finding uh, from this uh, study uh, was that top importers and exporters of malaria risk, and you can see in this diagram that the top exporters um, are, of course, countries, de developing countries that produce goods and services, for example, coffee and um, timber, uh, which then gets sent off to the developed nations. So developed nations are driving these malaria risks uh, in, in developing countries. And we have Germany, US, Japan, um, China, UK, France, these countries listed up on top, uh, which are the top 
uh, importer and the exporters down at the bottom, Nigeria um, and some of these countries in, in the African uh, continent. So linking malaria incidents in developing countries with deforestation, as I mentioned, and then to commodity production and then to global supply chain network. Next slide, please. So here we have a flow map uh, similar to the one that I showed for biodiversity, but here this is for malaria risk. And we looked at um, a number of stages of production, starting off with primary producers, which are primarily in um, countries in the African continent, to the first stage of production, which is the processing stage. So going from primary to processing and then um, adding value to a primary product, which then gets sent off to another country for final consumption, so final consumers. So we have this primary origin and then processing stage all the way to the final destination. And we noticed in this, in this study that you, from an international trade, trade perspective, the final consumers are sitting very much in developed countries and they are driving malaria risk in developing nations. Next slide, please. I hear the bell, so I need to hurry up. Um, so just some examples of the commodities that we found in this study. So Nigeria, for example, um, um, starting off from the primary uh, primary uh, producers, sends off timber to China, for example, cocoa beans to Netherlands, Germany, Belgium and France, um, Tanzania um, exports raw tobacco to Europe and Asia, for example, cotton and wood to India, Uganda, coffee again to Italy, Germany, Belgium and the and the US. So there's there's this international trade perspective and also how deforestation for the production of these commodities, which then eventually uh, get sent off to other nations for consumption. Next slide. I also wanted to briefly flag in my uh, presentation uh, that we've recently also started um, working and have have finalized and, and submitted and it has recently been accepted a paper on COVID-19. We've linked um, the disaster information in terms of what sectors are affected by COVID-19, the direct information that we were able to gather from international organizations um, with the lockdowns in place in various countries, what impact um, does that have on different sectors from a global perspective and also uh, in terms of social, economic and environmental indicators? Because this article is currently under embargo, I'm not able to speak about the results, but it is expected to come online um, in plus one in a couple of weeks um, time. We look at the social effects in terms of uh, losses in employment. Um, we also look at losses uh, in income because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also look at the environmental benefit in terms of reduction in emissions, um, which, which is a silver, silver lining uh, from, of, of this pandemic. So we quantify that uh, from a global, global perspective. We again use a multi-regional input-output table for this study. Um, and I've shown uh, sort of like a world map with, with the countries colored in, which essentially shows the resolution that we've uh, worked with for this for this study. But again, this is something to look out for if you're interested in knowing more uh, about the supply chain implications of the COVID-19 pandemic from a sector perspective and also at a global level. Next slide. So just summing up, why, why do we need to do these assessments? So what is the need for analyzing impacts in supply chains? So of course, we need to recognize issues in supply chains. I've, I've, I've given an example of malaria, malaria risk, which, which is um, a, one indicator that we recently worked on. Uh, COVID-19, again, if you want to see what impact COVID-19 has had on, on and is still having um, on international supply chains. Um, we are currently working on other indicators as well, for example, modern slavery. So if consumption of goods and services drives um, uh, child labor and supply chains, that needs that needs to be uh, brought to light and rectified as well. So identifying hotspots, which uh, we hope as researchers uh, would help in raising awareness, would help um, initiating multi-stakeholder engagement for ensuring that these impacts um, um, do not happen in the supply chain. And, and of course, in terms of raising awareness, we need to um, engage individuals, businesses, and all the way to, um, to policy makers. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
All right. Um, thank you very much, Arunima, uh, for your presentation. Um, so let's look at the question. Um, so let's see. Um, let me choose one. We have so many questions. Um, so could you, uh, um, or is it in this uh, indicator, indicator that is also considering a livelihood in export countries, is the additional income considered in the overall risk? Um, so yes, so for malaria risk, of course, um, uh, we've in this indicator, we've only um, considered the negative aspect. Uh, we also acknowledge um, that export of commodities from from developing nations to developed nations provides um, income and, and and support for people who are producing these these goods and services so of course there there is therefore a fine line between just saying stop the export uh, which which definitely will not be ideal and in, uh, in this scenario because um, of course these uh, uh, farmers who are producing these uh, agricultural products that get sent off to other uh, nations for export, they of course need that income for survival. Um, so for this particular indicator, we did not we did not consider the positive aspects, but in terms of taking away the results of this study for um, implementing strategies, we would of course definitely need to consider the positive aspects um, of of the export of these items, uh, which in this indicator, we only just consider the malaria risk driven by the developed nations. All right, thank you very much. Um, so now since time is like running, I would uh, now would like to welcome our third panelist, uh, Apollonia Miola. Um, she is a senior policy analyst uh, from the OECD and a senior economist, as well as a project manager at the European Commission for more than 15 years. So please unmute yourself and turn your camera on. We can see the slides and we are good to go. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Uh, my presentation will be focused on the uh, institutional aspects in managing the transboundary impacts related to the achievement of the SDGs. Actually, the focus is on the 2030 agenda and the fact that the global social and economic consequences of this COVID-19 crisis can reverse important progress made so far in uh, advancing in the 2030 agenda. The focus is on uh, this uh, aspect because uh, the multidimensional impacts related to COVID-19 uh, calls for uh, coherent political responses, which should also address the um, cross-country impacts related to the COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and... Um, and the OECD uh, Council recommendation on policy coherence for sustainable development provide the framework and the tools for government to, to deal with the, the holistic uh, uh, nature of the 2030 agenda and in particular can support also the recovery from uh, the COVID-19 for the institutions, of course. It is organized along three uh, main uh, uh, groups of uh, uh, actions, and, um, and the aim is uh, to support the process of the decision making to maximize the synergies and minimize the compromises in all areas of economic, social, and environmental policies. Uh, provide also support to balance national and international priorities uh, and also to address the cross-border and long-term effects. Um, this uh, recommendations is uh, this framework is organized along uh, eight main pillars. Uh, the first uh, is on political commitment and leadership uh, and uh, uh, to promote action by the world government for policy coherence for sustainable development, long-term strategic vision, the policy integration to capitalize on synergies and benefits across economic, social, environmental policies. And then the second group of pillars is about the role of government coordination 
to mitigate the, good, the divergences between uh, the central, the sectorial priorities and the policies. And um, the, num the, sec the, the next is about a subnational engagement in order to have coordination and coherence among the national and subnational uh, initiatives to achieve the SDGs, the stakeholder engagement in order to involve the civil society, but also any sectors of the economy, the uh, monitoring, reporting and evaluation, and with regard to the session of today, the, poli the policy and financial impacts. Um, I think that we can highlight this important uh, um, a pillar, which is about uh, the uh, impact assessment of any initiative taken by institutions uh, to achieve the SDGs, not just to consider the multidimensional aspects of the 2030 agenda, but also to consider the uh, across countries impacts, uh, the transboundary impacts. The next slide, please. Um, these are the key challenges that we have identified in a study that we started a few months ago and uh, whose report will be published in a few months, in September. And the key challenges are about the uh, analytical framework to identify the spillovers, the transboundary impacts, in, all, in, uh, in terms of methods, models and indicators. The, the former speakers have already uh, provided you with some excellent examples on how you can identify these, the, the spillover effects and the transboundary impacts. But it's also really important to analyze the role of the private sectors, and in particular, the role of the multidimensional enterprises in influencing the SDGs implementation of countries in which they operate. And the last point, which is the not, which is the, the main, uh, the field of the, uh, the governance department where we work, I work, is about the institutional mechanism and the coordination across countries, because it's uh, important to identify and also to estimate the transboundary impacts, but it's also important to provide the government with the tools to, co to manage these uh, uh, impacts and also to coordinate across countries. Next slide, please. And um, um, this is a, a schematic uh, um, representation of the pathways of impacts of country internal and external policies. Um, with regard to the internal country actions, we can identify three main channels of contagion of, of impacts, the pathway of impacts. One is the economic pathway related mainly on trade and financial regulation. The second one is about the social pathway related to social regulations, for instance, the quality of life and well-being. And the, the last is about the environmental pathway related to resource availability and pollution. This uh, also create extra country impacts. The domestic nation, national policies, uh, economic, social, environmental policies create extra country impacts. And again, each single uh, pathway of impacts create ec economy, society, environmental impacts in external countries. And then the last, uh, the last point is about the external country action, namely these, uh, the development policies, but also the foreign and security policy, uh, policies, they can create extra country impacts on economy, society and environment. Uh, it's really complex, but uh, it's not just about identification of impacts, it's about management in terms of a policy of these impacts, uh, internal and external, and vice versa, because also the country, uh, the country policy, the domestic country policies can be affected by other country policies. Next slide, please. And um, I think that you can also focus more on this uh, picture. Um, because uh, this, uh, in this picture, you can uh, see um, 
in practice the steps for the policy evaluation and design. All the impacts that I have uh, highlighted in the, the, the previous slide should feed this, uh, the policy and evaluation design that uh, the country, the government, uh, um, they, they consider in uh, the formulation in their legislation act. And um, the first point that they, when they start to design uh, a policy, in, if they want to, for instance, also manage the transboundary impacts, they have also to involve one or more countries. And then they can start with the ex-ante evaluation of the impacts of their, um, of their new uh, policy design. When I talk about ex-ante evaluation, I talk about the identification of possible socioeconomic and environmental impacts, identification of the possible transboundary impacts and identification of the affected country, notification of, by the countries of origin to the affected countries informing the planned policy actions and the possible impacts, consultation between the countries and the identification of the main socioeconomic environmental implication both in the countries of origin and in the affected countries and then evaluation of alternative policy options. And as you can understand, this is very complex in terms of uh, coordination among the countries when you want to design a new policy take into account the transboundary impacts is not just about the analytical framework is also about the the governance aspect the institutional mechanism that you have to take to put in place to manage the transboundary impacts across countries and then you can also uh, have the policy then the policy revision the policy implementation and interim evaluation of your policies with identification of the social, economic, environmental impacts, identification of the transboundary impacts again uh, created, the notification, consultation, and so far so on. The policy revision, the policy implementation, and again the export, ex post, pardon, evaluation. You can need you can also see, I mean, it's already, my God, it's, uh, it's time to stop. Um, it's really complex. It's complex because you have to combine analytical analysis with diplomatic and negotiation among the countries. Next uh, slide, please. So um, just a few recommendations. We do need to define guidelines for integrated SDGs impact assessment framework to identify and manage potential trade-offs and synergies among SDGs and across countries. The analytical framework, the index, the data set that the speakers, uh, the former speakers have extensive uh, um, ever analyzed and showed that they should feed this SDGs impact assessment framework. But we need also to define transboundary collaborations between experts from di different dis disciplinary background together with across countries collaboration at the governmental level. These are the fundamental factors that can support the evaluation of the potential drawback and the acceleration effects Next uh, slide, please. Um, we at the OECD uh, Governance Division Department, we have already started working to put in place this collaboration and um, we are going to establish the portal on SDGs governance that will be launched in a few weeks. But uh, uh, I think that the more important uh, aspect is a component of the SDGs governance, governance portal, which is the PCSD Observatory, an observatory which will, be, uh, which will include the three main components, a component on thematic analysis and research, which will be focused also on transboundary impacts, and which uh, will establish an international network of institutions working on this, to identify the transboundary impacts, but also a network of country the governments to share the best practice in managing the uh, transboundary impacts, but also all the, the, the pillars that I have uh, listed in the first slide. 
we will put also in place a, a specific component for the EU countries to uh, align the European semester with the SDGs, and we will provide also support and guidance for government. And I think this is a, a key element of the to put in place a global management of the transboundary impacts, which is the collaboration among international institutions and governments to manage the transboundary impacts. Uh, next, next slide, please. Well, if you are interested, I think that you can, in any case, um, check the, our portal, OECD portal, that the, uh, the slides are available, by, and we will uh, publish the report on transboundary impacts institutional and methodology to deal with the transboundary impacts in a few months. So we will uh, also share this report with you all. And then questions. All right. Apollonia, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. So um, please, uh, for the last uh, Q&A session, um, uh, ask questions in the, uh, uh, in the chat. Um, so I can see we already have a question. Um, can you give more information about the PCSD Observatory? Yeah, uh, actually, this is uh, um, we are still designing this observatory, which will be probably launched uh, uh, by the end of this year. And this is a supporting knowledge platform for the implementation of the PCSD recommendation, the, the recommendation on policy coherence for sustainable development. Um, as I said, it will be. Um, it will consist of three main components. A component will be to support the uh, governments to implement the PCSD framework. We'll provide them with an international database on the best practice and the good practice in uh, uh, implementing policy coherence for sustainable development, in particular to achieve the SDGs. And it will provide also a toolkit uh, toolkit assessment, which is uh, for the government to build the capacity to achieve the PCSD in their uh, national context. The a second component will, uh, um, will consist of uh, knowledge management and also in uh, um, developing a new analytical framework to develop a new research analysis. It will start with uh, the COVID-19 on uh, the COVID-19 focus and the transboundary impacts. And as I said, we will publish a report on transboundary impacts in September or October, but very soon. And, uh, and then this uh, component will be open to the country request for uh, additional analytical research activities. And then a third component, which is a component focused on collecting country experience at regional, national, regional and global level in, on PCSD. And a subcomponent of this will be focused on the European Union and the alignment of the European semester with the SDGs. The focus, of course, is on policy coherence for sustainable developments and uh, on the institutionals and uh, any tools that can support the countries to implement the PCSD. Um, is a knowledge platform, so is uh, it will provide. It is a sort of brokerage. The main activities is knowledge pro brokerage, just one component to develop a new analytical and uh, studies. Okay, thank you for answering the question. So now, uh, for the remaining uh, five minutes, I. Uh, or we would like to focus, as announced, on the graphic recording. Um, so all of you should see the drawing that was made now during this event. So in the beginning, you could see it was almost empty. So now um, I will also turn off my camera. So you should see now uh, like the, the picture fully. And um, so... Uh, Anna, 
Um, would you like to like share three highlights uh, with us uh, that you have uh, experienced through uh, this webinar? Uh, hello, Barbara. Yes, uh, thank you very much <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to say something about it. Well, I'm quite uh, overwhelmed, I must say, and <laughs> as I said before, uh, talking is not my key competence. Um, I think I'm probably the only one who is not an expert here in this round, and I'm just really impressed of yeah, what's going on, and really, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> think of any highlight. I just think this whole uh, topic is just um, yeah, very impressing and I okay. will try to learn more about it. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Guillaume, uh, would you like to um, give like a final remark um, based on the drawing? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, let me Thank congratulate you. Anna. That's that's absolutely uh, beautiful. And just at first glance, I think it summarizes very well um, what we discussed um, today. Um, I mean, let me thank again everyone for joining uh, today. Uh, it's an event that we usually do in New York at the High Level Political Forum. So we've been doing it for the past uh, three three years with the GIZ. Um, but one of the positive things of the situation is that we've never had so many people joining this event since we are now doing it remotely. And I see that we still have more than 160 people still. So I think we, we, we managed to capture at least the interest of some of the participants today. Um, let me also say one thing because I see that there's quite a number of questions that were not answered within the chat. Um, I'd be very happy uh, for those that were targeted at Finn and I to answer also and follow up by email after the event. Um, so just focusing on this, um, on this, on this picture, on this drawing, and also from what we discussed, I think there's three main points here that that I'd like to emphasize. I mean, the first one which I think was very clear uh, from Arunima's presentation, um, but also in, in our presentation in, in our work within the SDSN is that multi-regional input-output tables are very powerful econometric um, tools that allow us really now um, to track in a rather systematic way and including over time um, some of the impacts that are embodied into consumption and trade. Um, and I think in the COVID-19 context, they remain uh, more relevant um, than ever. And there's obviously the study from Arunima, which is specifically focusing on COVID. But this is a tool, um, I think, which is extremely powerful. Now, at the same time, there's still a need. I mean, these are quite complex models, as you have, as you have seen. There's still a need to raise awareness and bring these issues to policymakers. And I think that's one of the big um, aspects of our work within the, the, the SDSN. And that's why we try to summarize our findings within the policy sections of our report, but also to build online uh, data tools um, to provide an, an, an easy access um, for non-experts um, uh, and, and layman audience and policymakers so that they can understand where are they having impacts, what are the impacts in which supply chains and how to take uh, action. So that's, that's the first point. Um, then um, I think a broader point, and I think it was discussed in all three presentation, is um, that this is obviously a very relevant um, discussion and aspect for the future of um, the European uh, Commission. So. Uh, uh, Apollonia mentioned the work that they are doing on the European semester. We are also mobilizing our networks um, for, um, uh, let's see, uh, bringing together the European semester and bringing it closer to the content of the SDGs and, and, and the climate agenda and Paris climate uh, uh, agreement. And I think this issue of spillovers is really a, a very important aspect that should be part of the um, European uh, Green Deal. Um, and where the EU can really become um, among the leaders um, globally on those on those issues, and so there's really a place here here to fill. And by leaders, it means bringing those issues in some of the international uh, fora, whether it's the G20, the high-level political forum, um, uh, but also in its bilateral interaction, um, including, for instance, with, with China. And there's a very big um, Europe-China Europe, uh, meeting in, in September. Um, and I think these issues and the, the question of the supply chains are obviously very um, important. A third, a third point, and that's the, the, my final point, is that um, from the three presentation, I think there's really um, 
a, uh, an, a need moving forward to connect a little bit um, better the, the work that's done um, on the performance metrics, the outcome data, the impact data, um, so that were covered primarily by Arunima in my presentation today, with um, the elements from uh, uh, public governance, and essentially to strengthen our understanding of what good governance um, for spillovers uh, and for managing transparency, uh, transboundary impacts uh, means and how um, this would this would look like. And this is something that we have discussed with all the, the, the panelists here in the past, but this is, this is really something I think where um, we want to do more work uh, with the OECD, with the, Europe of Sin uh, the University of Sydney and within the SDSN on this um, issue. Finally, let me just mention some of the, the forthcoming reports that were, that were mentioned. Uh, Polonia mentioned this OECD uh, book uh, on trans transboundary impacts for the fall. Um, obviously, uh, uh, feel free to go and take a look at all the fantastic work of the PCSD uh, team. The University of Sydney study on COVID-19 and their fantastic study on malaria uh, risk as well um, using MRIO. Uh, and then in the SDSN, we launched um, two days ago the SDR 2020 uh, with the spillover index. We're launching our next European edition um, uh, in, in November. Um, and finally, we're going to release um, soon a working paper um, using public uh, using um, production-based accounting and consumption-based accounting to track countries' environmental impacts. I'll stop here. Thank you once again to all the participants, but also to the GIZ team for uh, for organizing the, the the meeting. And I hand it over to you, Nicole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, also, a big thank you uh, to Finn, uh, Apollonia, and Aronima for participating, and a huge thank you to you, Guillaume. Uh, for your presentation and also for this final remark now. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope your energy level is still up, mine is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it for today. And uh, have a great rest uh, of, the, uh, of your day and uh, stay safe. And uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye, you. thank you.